Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to the morning service here at Open Door. Psalm 42, the Bible says this, As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? I hope that you've come this morning thirsty for our God. He certainly has something wonderful and special for each of us. We'll begin this morning with singing page 405, The Banner of the Cross, verses 1 and 4. If you're able to stand, please stand with me as we sing. of light ye christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies against the foe in veils below let all our strength be held faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world faith is the victory the victory Thank you. You may have a seat. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are so thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're thankful for the cross of Calvary. And we're thankful that it's because of Calvary that we can have a personal relationship with you, that we can have peace in our hearts of of a home in heaven for all of eternity. And God, we're so uh, thankful also that it is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, that we receive um, the gift of eternal life. We're thankful it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, that you save us when we put our faith and trust in you. Father, this morning, would you help us in the matter of faith? For those who have never trusted you, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. But Father, for each one of us as believers who has trusted you in salvation, I ask that you'd help us with that next step of faith that you'd have us to take. (coughs) We ask that you would receive all the honor and all the glory from this service. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. It is good uh, to be in the Lord's house today. I appreciate um, all the flexibility last week with the online services and our family is doing much better. I just have a, a lingering cough that hopefully won't linger too much longer. Um, but we're thankful all to be back in good health. A few announcements uh, from uh, the bulletin. Uh, Master Clubs this uh, Wednesday night, 
uh, will start at 6.30 p.m. And just a reminder for all of our master clubbers, uh, many of you are really close to finishing your membership requirements, so make sure that you get that um, done for uh, this coming Wednesday, and that way you can uh, pass your membership and move on uh, to your book. And then also remember that there is going to be a special treat for everyone that comes. So that means edible, something edible for all of our master clubbers that come. And then um, for everyone that brings a guest and their first time guest. So like Eric, if you come to master clubs on Wednesday night, you'll get a special thing. And I guess since I invited you, I get the special thing too. <laughs> Unless someone else wants to invite Eric. But anyways, um, that'll be this coming Wednesday night. We had 14 uh, clubbers this past Wednesday, um, so we're thankful for um, each clubber that we can minister to. Uh, next Sunday, we'll be having uh, dinner on the grounds. That'll be right after the morning service. And so if you're going to be a part of that, um, uh, if you have any questions, you can see Betty. But I understand if you can bring a main dish and a side dish, and that way we'll have... Uh, plenty to eat, and so that'll be for next Sunday. And then coming up on Veterans Day, Friday, November 11th, we'll be having a family cookout activity, and that's open to the whole church family. We'll have a sign-up for that, and uh, we'll have, um, it'll just be in kind of an informal uh, cookout, but also if you want to play games, card games, or we'll have some other games that you can play outside as well available. Then there's some information about the missions conference. On Saturday for our missions conference luncheon, the church will be catering food for that. There's a sign up on the back table and um, we'll be catering from Chick-fil-A. Um, so just please pick, sign your name and pick one of the items. Um, my wife um, has recently ordered the kale salad. We're not getting the kale salad. The kale salad is about in a container about that big. Uh, I don't even think a rabbit would get full on that. Um, but the salads we're getting are the full big portion ones, and there's sandwiches as well. Uh, so please just sign up for that, and we're looking forward to our upcoming missions conference. Let's continue with our singing this morning. Uh, page 262, The Light of the World is Jesus, verses 1 and 4. <laughs> Page 288, verses 1 and 3, I am resolved. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have alert my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Since I'm glad and free, Jesus. 
wonderful singing this morning. If I could have Ted and uh, Scott come for our offering, have an opportunity to give back to the Lord as he's faithfully blessed us. Brother Scott, if you could ask a blessing on the offering this morning, please. Hey, at this time we'll dismiss our children for Junior Church and Children's Church. And the rest of you, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. I'd um, like to take you back on memory lane, uh, maybe back to elementary school or junior high or high school. That, for many of us, is a long ways away. Um, we've got some of our teenagers that are still in the service. For them, it's, it's right now. Um, but I can remember um, I went to a, a Christian school um, all my life. And uh, when your dad's the administrator, um, there's a good reason for you to be there. And I, I'm thankful uh, for that. But I can remember many times during, uh, whether it was recess, um, the, the free time that we had, and we were outside playing, that we'd uh, play a pickup game. Maybe it was basketball, maybe it was soccer, maybe it was football. But we play a pickup game, and, and you would have two people, and they'd pick teams, right? And so uh, usually it was the two most athletic guys. In some cases, I guess it would have been a girl. Um, but for the most time, it was guys. And then everyone that was going to play would line up, and then um, they would do something to figure out who would pick first, and they'd just go back and forth, back and forth. 
Um, I can honestly say that I was never the first person chosen. And uh, so that tells you a little bit about my athletic ability. Um, I was average, maybe a little bit under average when it came to uh, athletic ability. So my portion or my uh, time to get picked was towards the end of the line. Um, if I was ever picked last, it was such a painful memory for me that I've just blotted out of my memory. Uh, I'm sure it quite possibly could have happened. But those that are, depending upon the sport that you're playing, uh, they'll size up uh, the people that are going to play, and uh, they'll pick who they think uh, will help them uh, win the game. Well, if you were to look at the disciples, the 12 that Christ had chosen to follow him, and that now in our uh, message today, he's actually going to, uh, this was, talk about a step of faith for Christ, he was actually going to send them out by themselves. I mean, for, for quite a bit of time, they had traveled with him, they had followed him, they learned from him, but now he's actually going to send them out uh, to go ahead and do what he's taught them to do. Uh, kind of like parents, when you have <clears throat> your child with their learner's permit, and they finally get their license, and you're finally going to send them out alone, hoping uh, that they'll apply everything that they've learned. Well, that's, that's where Christ is. He's going to send them out. And when you look, <coughs> excuse me, when you look at the disciples, you see the group that has assembled together that Christ chose, that he called, it probably wouldn't be the ones that we would pick. If we were picking those that would um, be the ones who would be used to pen a portion of the New Testament, much of the New Testament, uh, pick those that would be leaders and pastors and churches, those that it was described of these disciples that had turned the world upside down, we probably wouldn't have picked from a group of fishermen, a tax collector, uh, Simon the Zealot who was basically a hothead, or you have Judas Iscariot who was a thief and a traitor, and really never was a believer at all. Uh, the disciples, they lacked a lot of things. They lacked understanding. They lacked humility. They lacked faith. They lacked commitment. They lacked power. Matter of fact, many times they found themselves getting into trouble, missing the point <coughs> of Christ's teaching. Lashing out at people who were different, saying the wrong thing, um, abandoning their commitment to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, in spite of all their failures and all their weaknesses, Christ was going to use them. And this passage that we're going to look at today, <coughs> I'm going to go from this mic to this mic. Turn my head and not have to um, try to shield the microphone. I don't want to blast anyone out. And my coughing kind of goes in spurts, so hopefully the spurt will um, be finished here soon. Uh, so here we're, we're seeing in this passage that we're going to read in just a moment, Christ is going to send out uh, his disciples on a special mission. And there are some lessons that we can learn from this. Let's go ahead and look at the passage, Mark chapter 6 beginning in verse 7 and reading down through verse 13. <coughs> and he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits, and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no script, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals and, and, put, and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, And what place soever ye enter into a house, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you when ye depart thence, shall shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick 
and healed them. Let's pray. Father God, I do thank you for this passage. I thank you for the truths that you have for each one of us. Uh, God, I pray that you'd uh, strengthen my voice, and I pray that you'd have the cough to subside. I pray that it would not be a distraction, but that each one of us would receive um, what you'd have for us this morning. Help us to understand that just as you used uh, this very unlikely group of men, <coughs> that, Father God, there's not a one of us here this morning that you can't use for your honor and your glory. So God, would you help us uh, to see these men that you used, and would we see that there's hope for you to use us today? We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. First of all, in verse number seven, we see the mission of the 12. Verse seven says, and he called unto him the 12 and began to send them forth by two and two and gave them power over unclean spirits. Why is it that he sent them forth two by two. Well, in understanding um, the Bible and understanding uh, the Old Testament law, um, we understand that it was important that if there was any type of, a, of an accusation, if there was some type of a charge brought up against someone, the law required that there be at least two witnesses. So one person could not um, just bring that accusation. In Deuteronomy Chapter 17 and verse 6, it says, At the mouth of two witnesses, or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death. But at the mouth of one witness, he shall not be put to death. And then in chapter 19 and verse 15, One witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity, or for any sin, and any sin that he sinneth. At the mouth of two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, shall the matter be established. And then in Numbers chapter 35, and verse number 30, here the Bible says this. Whosoever killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses, plural. But one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. <coughs> so already in the Old Testament, there was a precedent set that you need at least uh, two witnesses, especially in a matter um, where there was an accusation that we brought against someone, um, especially if they were going to um, have their life taken for murder. Uh, in Matthew chapter 10, and verses 2 through 4, Matthew 10 is kind of the companion passage for this. Uh, we have a listing of the 12 disciples, and, and we, we're not certain if this is actually a pairing of the disciples. Uh, but Christ paired the disciples and sent them out two by two. So again, this was um, in full agreement with the Old Testament and the precedent that had already been established. But it was also important. It would provide these men as they were to go out. It would provide them encouragement. Uh, just yesterday, we had five uh, folks go out on door-to-door -door visitation. And uh, with five, there wasn't enough for two for each group. And so I went by myself. But um, we had two groups of two, and uh, as they were going out, and when we came back, we <clears throat> kind of gave our reports of, of how the visits went, and uh, one person said, um, had nine friendly and one unfriendly, and uh, then the other group shared about um, how, how they could even determine a little bit about the person's background by walking up by some of the um, the, the decorations that they had in their yard. And many times, especially certain uh, face systems, you can realize, okay, this person is probably this type of a, of a belief system. And, and it's important to go out two by two. And, and <clears throat> Toshi and Justin were partners yesterday. And Toshi was talking about how Justin was a good partner and how Justin um, would make comments as they were going up to the door, kind of assessing the house and maybe what the person, what type of a belief system they had. And he says, but as soon as that, that door opened, he would stand behind me and I would do the talking. And it's like, they made a great team. And I said, that way, if there was a dog, the dog would get you first and Justin could run away. Um, I remember when we were on deputation, I was going door to door um, with uh, one of the deacons of a church uh, from Mansfield Baptist Temple. And he was, uh, he was a meter reader. 
And he said, there was a time where you actually had to go inside the house to read the meters. And uh, he said, if we find a dog, he said, all I've got to do is be faster than you. And I looked at him, I said, well, I think I'm faster than you. He said, not if I push you down first. <laughs> Just good edification uh, when you're out door to door. But as they're, as they're going forth, uh, Christ sent them on purpose, two by two. It's a method also that John the Baptist used as he sent out his disciples, his followers. And it's a method that we continue to use today as we go out to reach the lost. And so the mission, he sent them out two by two. But notice also in verse 7, <coughs> it says, and gave them power over unclean spirits. The word power there refers to an inerrant power. Christ was taking some of his own power and giving it to his disciples. So what Christ was able to do, the disciples now would be able to do. When it came to um, dealing with unclean spirits, casting out demons, the disciples would have that ability, that power. When it came to healing those who were sick, the disciples would now then have that power. It wasn't their ability, but it was a power that Christ gave them. Um, an important uh, disclaimer here is that this was, was part of the time period where God had not completely given us his word. And so this was a time where there were some specific sign gifts that God gave that we believe here at Open Door Baptist Church uh, that were temporary, uh, that were just for this time period. And, and so these disciples, and, and later on after Christ died on the cross, rose and, and went to heaven, um, they would go out and, and they would um, reach the lost. Uh, these sign gifts would help authenticate their message, uh, the ability to perform these miracles. But Christ is the one who gave them the power. Uh, I'm thankful that when it comes to reaching this lost world, that it's not just in and of ourselves, our abilities. Acts 1.8, Christ said to disciples before he ascended into heaven, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. <coughs> That power that the disciples received is the same power that you and I have today. And so the mission that Christ has given us as a church is to take the gospel, to reach Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And I'm so thankful that he's given us the power to do that. That power is within the Holy Spirit of God. Certainly there are times where we feel inadequate where we feel like, oh, if I, could just, if I could just get the right illustration, if I could just reason with this person, if I could just use um, this argument, then maybe they would believe. But it's important for us to remember that the power is in the Spirit of God and the Word of God. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and of salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's not in my wit, it's not in my humor, it's not in my um, reasoning ability. It is in the gospel. It is through the power of the Holy Spirit. That means that God has given me a mission field. Uh, our teenagers, your classroom, your teachers, your classmates, those that you ride the bus with, those that you may uh, compete in sports with, those that you hang out with, God, it, you're like, man, I'm in they don't even know that I'm a Christian. Well, that would be a good place to start. It's a good place to start to, to share with them that you're a Christian. And you can even do that by inviting them to church. Hey, why don't you come this Sunday to church with me? Uh, we got a teen Sunday school class and we got a message after that. Love to have you come as my guest. You see, that... That's intimidating in and of ourselves, by the way, just not teens, but those that are working, our co-workers, those that we meet out in the community, those in our neighborhood. What is my mission? My mission is to reach those that God en enables me to come in contact with. 
And so the disciples had a mission. They were sent two by two, and they were given great power. Not only have we seen the mission of the 12, but now the mandate of the 12. In other words, God gave them very specific commands as they went forth. Uh, Verses 8 and 9, they were not to take any extras with them for the journey. They could take a walking stick, the shoes that they had on their feet, the clothes on their backs. They weren't to take a, a, a script or a traveler's bag. They weren't to take money or food. They weren't even supposed to take an additional cloak, which would kind of have the idea of, of wealth, to, have, to travel more than, than one uh, coat. And so when we think about this mandate, these commands that Christ gave, uh, uh, a few observations. <clears throat> First of all, I believe that God was wanting his disciples uh, to learn to live by faith. That's what he'd spent his time teaching them. <clears throat> he'd already told them that the foxes have their holes, the birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He taught them how he lived by faith, and he wanted them to live on complete dependence upon him to supply for their needs. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, If I clothe the lilies of the field... If I take care of the birds um, in, the, in the air, I will take care of you. Philippians 4, 419, but my God shall supply your every need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And so Christ, as he was sending them out with these commands of what they could and could not take, he was wanting them to learn to rely upon him, to trust upon him to supply their every need. And God has given us a mission to reach this lost. I think about our upcoming missions conference. I think about the commitments that we will make over the upcoming year to give to missions. And and that really is a matter of faith. Lord, you know, I I have no idea. I, I hope that the prices of eggs doesn't go up this next year like it did this year. I I may not be eating too many eggs. I may not have too many uh omelets. But you know what, Lord, I, I'm, I'm going to, by faith, trust you to supply and provide for my needs. So, God, I'm going to continue to give of my tithes to you, honoring you. And, God, I, I'm going to give to missions. And that, that takes a step of faith to trust the Lord Jesus Christ to go forward with that. And so he's one of the disciples to live by faith. I believe also he wants them to understand the matter of urgency. In other words, he wants them to go now. He doesn't want them to to go and to to pack their bags and to go do their shopping to make sure they they have everything that they think that they'll need. Talk about weighing them down for the journey. But there was a sense of urgency. Uh, The harvest field was ripe unto harvest. And they need to get out and they need to preach about the kingdom of God. They needed to, to um, show folks the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and the way to heaven. And so it is, the urgency is for us today to not put off fulfilling the mission of Christ. Not to put off telling that lost family member about the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to put off inviting that coworker or that classmate, or that teammate, or that teacher, or that coach, sharing with them the gospel. We know not what a day may bring forth. We don't know what tomorrow holds forth. We need to sense the urgency that Christ was sharing with the disciples here today. The time to tell the world is today. The time is right now. Christ said uh, to his disciples when talking about the woman at the well in John 9, 4, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. The mandate was to help them learn to have faith and dependence upon him, but also for them to sense the urgency. Looking at the world today, looking at the events of today, it should not be too long before the Lord comes back. 
And we need a sense and urgency to reach our family, to reach our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, to reach those who God has brought into our realm of influence. <coughs> so some things that they were to take, <coughs> some things they were not supposed to take. In verse 10, we see him say, In whatsoever place ye enter into a house, there abide until ye depart from that place. And, whatso and whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust from your feet for a testimony against them. <coughs> Christ was telling them that when it came to hospitality, when it came to God providing for their needs, um, we'll put it in terms that maybe we can understand. If the accommodations were Motel 6, like and not the Hilton like they weren't to be discriminatory towards the provisions and 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 by the way if God I'm sure that maybe some of the disciples had some Hilton like accommodations but they probably had some that were not even to the par of Motel 6 what God was saying was you need to be thankful for the provisions that I have given you the Christian life, our life, we're thankful for comforts, but that should not be the focus of our life. The disciples, as they served the Lord, it was not about comforts, but they were to have a heart of gratitude for everything that they, had, that they would receive and to be content with what the Lord provided. Are we content today? Are we seeking just to be comfortable Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. In 1 Timothy chapter number 6 and verses 6 through 12, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of the money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And so here we see that <coughs> they were simply to be thankful for how the Lord would provide for them. In verse 11, he gave instructions if they rejected, if they did not receive the message, then they were to shake off the dust off their sandals, basically meaning that there would be judgment. He said it would be more tolerable, tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than those who you gave the message that I gave you to give, and they rejected that message, they will receive greater judgment than those in Sodom and Gomorrah. As I was thinking about that, I was like, why? Why, you know, the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah, that was pretty severe judgment. Um, raining down brimstone and fire and destroying both cities. <coughs> why would they receive greater judgment? What was the witness that Sodom and Gomorrah had? The witness they had, yes, they had general revelation, but they also had a carnal believer lot. And so they didn't necessarily have the best witness. But here, the disciples who Christ has given them his power to perform miracles and to teach the truth, he says if they reject, they'll be under greater judgment than those of Sodom and Gomorrah. And one of the hardest things that, that is natural for any of us when we witness is to take personal offense when people reject. When people reject the gospel, when they reject, when you don't even get a chance to say who you are and what you'd like to give them, and they slam the door in your face, that's hard. But it's important for us to realize that they're not rejecting us. They're rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. They're rejecting the gospel. The disciples... <coughs> Their message was a message of hope. And yet when that message was rejected, their message was now a message of judgment. 
the mission. He sent them out two by two. He gave them his power. The mandate, I want you to live by faith. Take just the bare essentials. I want you to trust me. I want you to get out right away. This is urgent because eternity is at stake. And by the way, whatever I provide for you, just be thankful for it. And if folks reject, realize that they will stand in judgment one day. Now, what was the message of the 12? Look at Mark chapter 6 and verse number 12. And they went out and preached that men should repent. Their message was one of repentance. It's not a very popular message in their day, and it certainly wasn't, isn't a very popular message today. It wasn't a very popular message that Jonah wanted to preach to the men and women of Nineveh, but his message was very brief. Repent. In so many days, judgment will come. That was the message of Jonah to Nineveh. The disciples' message was one of repentance. The word repent there means a change of mind, which produces a change in direction. So we have repentance for salvation. Peter said on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of sins. He wasn't saying be baptized in order to be saved. He was saying you should be baptized as a picture of what? Because you have been saved, because you've repented. And what were they repenting of? What were they changing their minds about? They were changing their minds about who Christ was. They thought Christ was an imposter. But Peter came and preached that Christ was the Messiah, that he was crucified, that he was that he um, was buried, and that he rose again the third day. You need to change your minds about who Christ is. Stop depending. You have thought that it's the law. You have thought that that's the way to be saved. You thought that it's your works. You thought that it was your um, religion. You thought that it was your membership. You thought that it was your baptism. You thought it was all these things. But you need to repent of that, and you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. That's the message that the disciples preached. Repentance. Change your mind about Christ. But it's just not a, a, a message for salvation. Yes, repentance is needed to be saved. But there's also repentance in the life of a believer. And when we as believers find ourselves in sin, we need to repent from that sin. It's just not enough to say, I'm sorry. I was wrong. And then to go back to the sin again and again and again. That's not repentance. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 7 and verse 10, Paul, verse 10 and 11, Paul was writing to the church of Corinth and he's basically saying, I'm glad that when you got my first letter, it was very blistering. You had a lot of sins in your lives, but you didn't, you didn't respond with worldly sorrow. You responded with godly sorrow. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. Well, what was this godly sorrow? What was this repentance for the believers in Corinth? He says, for behold, this self thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort. What carefulness it wrought in you. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. Yea, what zeal. Yea, what revenge. And all these things ye have proved yourselves to be clear of this matter. Yes, for the unbeliever, they need to repent of whatever they've been trusting in to be saved and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And for the believer, we need to repent of the sin that has ensnared us that has bound us. We need to repent, we need to acknowledge it, and we need to turn from it and turn to righteousness, turn to godliness, turn to holiness. And so the message was one of repentance. The mission, they were sent out two by two. 
and they were given power. The mandate, um, it, it's an urgent matter. You need to go right away, and I want you to learn to depend upon me. If whatever they provide for you, be thankful for it. If they reject you, realize that there is great judgment. And the message was one of repentance. And then the ministry we see in verse 13. It says, and they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. They had a great ministry. In other words, they had his power. So that means they were able to cast out demons. That means they were able to see people healed from their infirmities. As I mentioned earlier, these were sign gifts, manifestations of God's power to authenticate their message. And while <clears throat> to have the power of God to perform the miracles the disciples performed would be pretty neat. Think about some of the areas in the world today that are demonic strongholds to be able to go in and to cast out demons. Think about the hospitals that are full of people that are sick and infirm and having the ability to go and to heal them. That would be great. That would be wonderful. But we don't have those gifts today. But greater than casting out demons, greater than seeing people healed of, of a sickness that they had that the doctors had no answer, had no remedy for, had no cure for, greater than all of that is the mission that Christ has given each and every one of us to take his wonderful message. And the one who said, let there be light. He created out of nothing. That's pretty amazing. But more amazing than even the creation of, of this world is the creation of a new soul, is the cleansing of a sinner from his sins, and given the Spirit of God, given a new nature. And that, my friend, is a mission that you and I have. As we take the gospel to our family, as we take the gospel to our coworkers, as we take the gospel to our classmates, as we take the gospel to those in the different ministries of this church, uh, I'm, I'm excited and praying that soon we will see some first fruits of our master club's ministry. And that there will be children that, that trust Christ as their personal savior as a result of that. And when an individual bows their head and they choose to trust Christ as their personal Savior, that is the greatest demonstration of God's power. For someone who is lost and doomed and damned to hell for all of eternity, for them to have their sins forgiven, for them to be born again into God's family, for them to have the gift of God, which is eternal life. Oh, the gospel-saving power is greater than any power the disciples had, and it's greater than any pow other power than the power of the gospel to transform and change our lives. We've seen Christ now taking those who he had trained and sending them out. And by the way, if you come to our visitation time here at Open Door Baptist Church, we're not just not going to... I'm not going to have you walk up to the door with me and I'm going to ring the doorbell that I'm going to step behind you. Okay, if you've never done that before, that's not how we, if we do here. We want to teach you. We want to train you. But it is best to go two by two. It is best to have someone else there to maybe help if the conversation gets stuck, to maybe help if there is, um, you know, a, a rabid dog that's, that's pestering and, and to keep them detained. Or, or to help, or even to pray. God, help us to be able to reach out to the lost. Our mission is to reach them. And so today, as we close our service, am I willing to trust the Lord in his mission? He's given every one of us who know him as our Savior 
He's given us the power. His Holy Spirit is within us. We have the word of God. We do not have to be ashamed. It may be this week that you start by taking a gospel track from the foyer and giving it to someone and just asking them. That's a good start, great start. Would you read this sometime when you have a chance? Or it may be you ask a classmate or a coworker, hey, what do you do on the weekend? Oh, well, that, that's neat. You know, it's good to spend time with family. Um, on Sunday, I, I go to my church. And there I learn more about God and how he would have uh, me to live my life. And, and I learn more to how, how to have peace and hope and comfort in these troubling times. Would, would you be my guest this Sunday? Would you come with me to church? That's a start. And some of you right now, you're terrified at that. And of ourselves, we can't. But God has given us the, the mission to go and to take the gospel and so it may be someone on your team. It may be a teacher. It may be a coach, coworker, neighbor, whoever it is. But we need to begin now to reach out with this glorious gospel message. Have we been holding back out of fear or failure? Or are we willing to trust the Lord? He is the one. Do we see it as, and this, this is sometimes where I find myself, well, it's not a good time now. By the way, there will never be a good time. There will always be, there will always be an excuse of why not to open your mouth and share the gospel. Why not to give the gospel? To, well, they're busy right now. Yeah, but if they die without Christ and go to eternity, well, I don't think that they want to hear. I've already shared it once. I don't think they want to hear it again. I was, um, Rob and I, this past week, we were watching um, some videos of an evangelist <clears throat> confronting people with the gospel. And I told Robin after watching this one, I said, Robin, I said, I would have walked away from that person like in the first five minutes. But that person, that evangelist, he just kept at it. And he was gracious. He wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, they were closing the door and he shoved his foot in the door and said, no, you're not closing the door. I've got a mess. No, it wasn't like that at all. But he was just very gracious, and he was coming. Now, at the end of the presentation, the man didn't get saved. But he listened to, further, he listened to the gospel presentation further because he wasn't fearful. He was assured of the power of the Spirit of God and of the Word of God, and that God is the one that's going to do the work. In the heart, and maybe it's just a matter of urgency. I haven't been urgent. You know, I haven't been willing to take a step of faith and trust the Lord to either share myself or to give um, more or to even begin giving to missions. Christ had a mission and a mandate and a message for the disciples. God help us to know Christ's mission for us, for us to sense the urgency of it, and for us to share the message. The message is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent of what you've been believing in. It's not, it's not some denomination or some other person. It's not being in a good family, a good home that's going to get you to heaven. You need to repent of that. Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. Let's close in prayer. Father, um, I thank you for your grace this morning. And I thank you that you didn't, you didn't look to pick perfect people to be your disciples. As a matter of fact, you chose a lot of men with a lot of character flaws and a lot of imperfections. But God, I'm thankful for the time that you invested in them and that you are willing to send them forth as you gave them your power. God, we, we may not have memorized the Bible yet. We may not be able to fully articulate the gospel message right now. 
But God, help us to sense the urgency to get the gospel message out, to live by faith, trusting you, to realize that you have given us the power in your spirit and in your word. And God, may we be faithful. The message that there's only one way to heaven is not a popular message. It's not a message that will that our youth will be the most popular in their class or on their team, that as a worker in the work environment, there may even be some, some ridicule that happens because of it. But God, help us to be consumed with your mission to reach the lost. Forgive us for fear. Forgive us for delay. And help us, Father, to accept your mission and to share your message. I pray these things in Christ's name. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, in just a moment, the piano will play. And when it plays, if God's spoken to your heart, we're not going to have folks stand. Um, you can pray at your seat. You can come down here to an altar and pray if you want to pray with a family member. If you would like to pray with someone, we'd be happy to have someone pray with you about the specific need. But has God spoken to your heart about his mission? Have you sensed the urgency of it? Have you been willing to take the step of faith? Is there someone even right now that God is burdening your heart for the gospel message? As the piano plays, if God's spoken to your heart, would you spend some time talking to him? If you'd like someone to pray with, we'd be happy to pray with you. If you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, God loves you. He wants to save you from your sins. That very message that the disciples took is a message that this church believes and shares. Would you be willing to trust him today? Would you allow us to take you and a Bible and show you in just a few moments how you can have the hope of eternal life? Would you allow us to help you this morning? Father God, we thank you for being in your house today. I thank you for each one that's here. And um, I pray that our hearts would have been challenged by um, the men that you used. And I'm thankful that we don't have to be a superstar with some great super ability, but that God, you can use us just as we are. Help us to believe the truth of your word. And help us to have a sense of urgency to share that with others. Forgive us for where we've fallen and failed, where we have allowed the fear of men uh, to keep us from being that witness. And uh, we pray that we would uh, see folks saved, baptized, and discipled here at Open Door Baptist Church. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Lord bless you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you.